Salut tout le monde et bienvenue sur Demos Kratos. Il n'y a pas longtemps, j'ai croisé une publication Facebook de Greenpeace France et ça m'a fait comme un électrochoc. Greenpeace France, c'est 40 ans d'action non violente, de désobéissance civile et de détermination pour protéger l'environnement et la biodiversité. Ils se félicitent de se battre depuis plus de 40 ans pour la préservation de la planète. Mais est-ce que c'est pas un aveu d'échec au final moi je pensais que la non-violence c'était la stratégie la plus rapide, la plus efficace, celle qui nous permettrait de sortir du capitalisme et de... Peter Gelderlos, comment la non-violence protège l'État C'est des conneries ça. Prochain la non-violence, on a besoin de la répression étatique, un lecteur plus difficile, quand c'est un patriarcat, le capitalisme. Faut que j'aille prendre l'air. Et si on s'était trompé et si la non-violence n'était pas la meilleure stratégie, mais simplement une des stratégies parmi toutes celles possibles Au final, est-ce que les marches pour le climat font peur au système Je crois que j'ai quelques questions à poser à Peter Gelderlos. Peter Gelderlos, welcome on Demos Kratos. Uh, first, could you introduce yourself Yeah, uh, my name is Peter. Uh, I come originally from, from Virginia in the United States, but I've lived for the last 12 or so years in, in Catalonia, in Barcelona. Uh, I'm uh, an anarchist. I've been active in, in different social projects. Uh, I also do a lot of writing, um, including the book How Nonviolence Protects the State. Could you present your meaning of violence in your book? Yeah, actually I argue against giving importance to the term violence, specifically because it's such a difficult term to define. Every group has its own definition, even proponents of pacifism or of nonviolence have no consensus about what uh, violence means, and the media and the police are constantly projecting this very self-interested definition of violence, which if... Uh, a homeless person steals from a store or somebody breaks a bank window, that's violence. But the things that the state does every day, the things that capitalism does every day, that isn't portrayed as, as violence. And if we take a global look, the things that cause the most harm, the things that kill the most people or cause the most suffering are structural. They're not necessarily something that one individual does to another. They certainly don't happen in a protest, but they're results of capitalism, of private property, of scarcity, of climate change, drought, disease, disease when, there, when medicine exists for the disease, but it's too expensive. Um, so if we understand structural violence, then violence is everywhere. And no one can really take this pure posture of being non-violence. That becomes clearly hypocritical or, or uh, an illusion. So the most important question becomes, how do, we, how do we transform this? How do we destroy these structures that are causing so much harm? And how do we create uh, a society in which people can take care of one another? So, so for me, then, the, the definition of non-violence would be a social movement uh, philosophy or strategy that tries to exclude violence. And it doesn't matter what their specific definition of violence is. To me, the most important thing is, is that they make this dualist definition, this dichotomy, and say these are the good tactics, these are the bad tactics, and these have to um, be excluded. All social movements are heterogeneous, all social movements are diverse, and I think that's their strength. So I don't advocate violence, I advocate a diversity of tactics. And specific tactics can be criticized and should be criticized, but I think it's simplistic to create this uh, dichotomy with the good, pure tactics and the, the bad, violent tactics. And this also plays into uh, discourses of the police and of the media. And we also have the idea that a revolution using violence will automatically mm -hmm. lead to a new violent political regime. Yeah. Uh, I think that all of the examples that show that, this is a real problem, revolutions that create new violent systems. Liberal revolutions in the 18th and 19th century that created the violent states of the United States, France, etc. Um, socialist revolutions in, in Russia, in China, that created new forms of capitalism, that created gulags and so forth. Uh, the, the common characteristic isn't that they used violence, whatever that means. The common characteristic is that they all wanted to create a new state. And a state is based on imposition. A state is based on forcing people to work, on preserving structures of exploitation and control. If we look at certain anti-colonial rebellions in the Americas, in the Caribbean, we can find decentralized examples of, of Africans who revolted against slavery 
or indigenous nations that, were, um, that fought back against colonialism. For example, Red Cloud's War in North America or the wars of the Mapuche against Spanish colonialism. They successfully killed many, many colonizers. They killed slave owners, uh, uh, colonizers, um, generals and soldiers. And after they won a specific war and kicked these people out, they didn't create a new oppressive system because their goal was never to create a new state. They didn't start killing one another. So this whole idea that, that violence will create more violence is based in the ambiguity of the term violence. The fact that we can't give a specific definition to this um, it makes it easy to, to manipulate. Um, also, uh, uh, an ex-Black uh, Panther, Russell Maroon Schultz, wrote a very interesting study comparing the centralized hierarchical uh, slave rebellions in the Caribbean to the decentralized non-hierarchical ones. So, for example, in Haiti, um, at different moments in history, uh, anti-slave rebellions took, um, or, or anti-slavery rebellions took different forms. And the ones that were decentralized were most uh, militarily effective and had the, made the least complicity with European colonialism, whereas the, uh, the movements that, were, that actually mimicked European organizational forms, they created centralized armies, they had a central leader, they were more patriarchal, and they were more likely to enter into um, some kind of complicit relationship with European colonial powers and even help uh, reproduce slavery. Nonviolence seems to be more inclusive and uh, that is why so many people declare themselves uh, nonviolent. But according to you, nonviolence is, on the contrary, a racist and patriarchal strategy. Could you develop this idea? Yeah. Um, nonviolence has uh, racist and patriarchal potentials or specific histories. There, it's certainly possible to have a nonviolent practice that's not racist or patriarchal. But there's a long history, for example, in the United States, the civil rights movement against racism there in, in the 50s and 60s, nonviolence played an important role to allow for progressive whites to exert a paternalistic influence over the, uh, over the movement. And many times, even Martin Luther King complained about how um, the, the bigger stumbling block to the movement were these, these whites who pretended to be allies but said, you know, don't, don't be too radical. It, the, they were worse than the Ku Klux Klan, he said. And for example, Martin Luther King, uh, he went around armed. He went around with a gun for self-defense. And that's something that, um, that white dominant history has, has erased because it's uncomfortable for, for privileged people. Uh, in terms of, of patriarchal dynamics, um, Gay Pride, which is celebrated around the world in, in June, uh, that marks a, a riot against the police when the police were in, in Greenwich Village in New York were harassing a, a bar of, of gay people and lesbians and, and trans people. And that riot was started by trans women uh, attacking the police and then all of all of, trans women of color who lived on the streets who were extremely um, oppressed attacking the police as a response to um, to police violence. And also there, there are so many stories of, uh, of women's self-defense, armed self-defense in Kurdistan. The fact that women are, are taking up weapons and women have their own military units has been extremely transformative to gender relations there. In the Spanish Civil War, the fact that women could join the anarchist militias and go to the front also was, was extremely transformative and, and subverted the patriarchy in, in that experience. Um, so we're constantly taught that more oppressed people are more vulnerable. Uh, there are many situations in which people, maybe without papers or, or people for any reason, have uh, a perfectly valid reason not to want to um, uh, be in the front lines of a riot. It is possible to, to have dialogue, to have... Um, uh, preparation for moments of protest and preparation within social movements that allows for a multiplicity of spaces. This is something that in the anti-globalization movement was done very effectively. There would be lots of planning for blockades using a diversity of tactics. The people who want to use nonviolent blockades can be in this zone. The people who want to fight with the cops or do property destruction can be in that zone. People who want to have something a little more in the middle can be over here. And it was very effective and very difficult for the police to to overcome. 
uh, nonviolence prevents that dialogue. It prevents that solidarity. And, and it sells this narrative, which is in the end a racist and a patriarchal narrative, that um, uh, being combative, that fighting back, that self-defense belongs to privileged people. Uh, Self-defense and fighting against oppression has always been a very, very important part of the histories of trans people, of women, of people of color, against colonialism. It's very comfortable for um, privileged uh, white people or men to think that, um, you know, I, if I'm peaceful, I'm being in solidarity with, with more oppressed people. But those are decisions that those people have to make for themselves. And that decision can only be made if, if we have all of the options. So there is a need to be solidaristic, to allow people to, to have a space for nonviolent tactics, but it can't be exclusive, it can't be the only option. The Nonviolent Movement as a Reference Book, Blueprint for Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, by Sergei Popovich. He argues that nonviolent actions are more popular, and that is why they would be more efficient. What do you think about this assumption and about uh, this book? Yeah. Uh, it's important to note that uh, Popovich worked for Stratfor. He worked for what's one of the largest private security companies in the world, snitching, passing information uh, about other activists from um, social movements. And that the U.S. government has a very, very favorable opinion of Popovich. Uh, Popovich worked closely with Gene Sharp's model. Gene Sharp received money from the U.S. Defense Department for his thesis work. So if you so these are referred to as the color revolutions, uh, starting with Otpor in Serbia, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Cedar Revolution in Lebanon, etc. It's no coincidence that these movements are always targeting governments that uh, are not friendly to U.S. or European interests. So they use a very superficial mass nonviolence to mobilize people, to get people in the streets, and create a political crisis. But they're incapable of creating any more profound social change. So uh, you have um, uh, private security officials with Stratfor and US uh, uh, Department of Defense officials talking very favorably about Popovich, talking very favorably about Gene Sharp's model as a model for regime change. So the invasion of Iraq was very expensive for the US. It was disastrous for the US, but This method has been effective in Ukraine, in Serbia, in many other countries, getting rid of regimes that were maybe closer to Russia and bringing in regimes that were just as corrupt, just as uh, uh, capitalist and authoritarian, but favorable to U.S. interests and, and EU interests. Um, this whole idea that nonviolent movements are more popular and they can get more people is only thanks to people like Popovich who are always... Uh, denouncing what they call violence. They're denouncing more combative struggle. But if you look at um, the anti-police movement in the U.S., this brought hundreds of thousands of people into the streets all across the country. It was the first time in a long time in the U.S. that you had a movement spread across the entire country. And it was started by people fighting back against the police, even people bringing, bringing uh, guns into the streets or using Molotov cocktails and things like that. In... Um, In Spain, uh, the, the movement for general strikes against austerity, it grew the more that people rioted because people were angry. People were getting kicked out of their houses. People were losing their retirement. This makes, this makes people angry and they have a very good reason to attack banks. If you, all you do is march in the streets and just shout slogans, the only people who hear you are, are the politicians thinking about how to manipulate you, how to use this to get elected. They don't make any real changes. So uh, when people start to realize that they can make the changes directly, that they can get rid of the banks, that they can take over housing and replace this idea of private property with the idea of housing belongs to the people who live in it, but they can only do that through direct action, that inspires people. That, that's what brings people out into the streets. And it's very, very telling that since the end of the Cold War, since 1990, globally, the, the maximum that a purely nonviolent movement has achieved is superficial regime change. They're able to get rid of one politician and put in another politician, but all of the social structures of capitalism, of exploitation, of oppression, they stay intact. So the only movements that have made steps to achieving a, a social transformation, a real profound revolutionary change, have used a diversity of tactics.
So the problem is not the use of peaceful tactics. There are many peaceful tactics that we have to use. Assemblies, um, health clinics, like uh, taking care of each other, finding housing for people. But these, uh, they, go, they go hand in hand with more combative tactics. They go hand in hand with sabotage. They go hand in hand with, with collective self-defense. How, how can you occupy housing for, for um, families of, uh, of immigrants without papers if you can't defend that housing? The police exist to uphold capitalist laws. So it's only been through combative tactics that we've been able to achieve these more, these more transformative changes in, in society. So actually healing and fighting, uh, taking care of, uh, of ourselves and sabotaging capitalism, they go hand in hand. You write, uh, nonviolence implies that it is better for someone to be raped rather than using the pen in his pocket and planting it in his assassin's juggler. But that is not true, because four pages further, you say nonviolent activists allow self-defense. So in theory, mm -hmm. destroying a Monsanto factory, for instance, uh, that kills humanity and Earth, should be considered as a nonviolent action, because it is self-defense. Yeah. Um, specifically, I say that some nonviolent activists make exceptions for self-defense. Most, uh, like the Gene Sharp School, Popovich, Um, most of these, they, they don't allow for, for combative self-defense. So that's, that's uh, relating more to differences of opinion within, um, within nonviolent circles. Um, I find that most nonviolent activists speak very, very little about direct personal self-defense against uh, racist violence or sexist violence. It's, it's not um, usually given a lot of attention. If we take the idea of self-defense, though, Um, let's look at climate change. Climate change is threatening everybody. Governments have, have shown that they're completely unwilling, completely incapable of, of um, making any real changes. All of these corporations are there every day making billions of dollars, destroying the environment. Um, so technically, if self-defense is nonviolence, people could justify uh, killing the CEOs of oil companies Or, or like they do in the Niger Delta, kidnapping oil workers, um, fighting with the police to be able to get through police lines and set fire to the banks that are financing uh, climate change and profiting off of climate change. So if, if self-defense has, has legitimacy, then nonviolence, it loses meaning. Uh, because you can, I mean, just like you can justify, you know, killing Hitler uh, as, as action against um, uh, uh, the Holocaust, Um, if, if you can justify killing within nonviolence, then nonviolence becomes a meaningless term. Okay. In France, we have two new movements, uh, the Yellow Jacket mm -hmm. for the social question and Extinction Rebellion for the ecological one. Both revendicate themselves as nonviolent mm -hmm. and don't hesitate to criticize a violent group mm -hmm. as the Black Bloc, for instance. Uh, what do you think about them and uh, do you have some advice for them and for their uh, fight? Yeah, um, so I've only been in France for a short time, so I'm obviously not an, an expert about the, the Yellow Jackets. Um, but for example, I, I learned recently that here in Lyon, um, uh, at the beginning, the uh, fascists were trying to come into the, the Gilles Jaunet movement and, and people resisted that fighting and, and kicking them out. Uh, I think it's, it's a historical lesson that all of humanity has learned that fascism can't be reasoned with, that fascism has to be opposed uh, forcefully because they'll invent, they're, they're not thinking logically, they'll invent any reason to take advantage of people's fears to gain power. And so I think the people in Lyon who fought against the fascists in the, in the Gilles Jaunet movement, uh, they did the right thing. And, and at a certain moment, they, they kicked out the fascists. And I think that's very important because a movement that's so heterogeneous and so decentralized, like the Yellow Jackets movement, has a lot of potential, but it's also dangerous because this is a place that, it's a space that could be manipulated. It's something that the fascists could come into to, to tell people the problem is not uh, the government or, or, or capitalism, the problem is the immigrants. So, so it's very important to, to be in those spaces to, to prevent right-wing discourses. Um, I understand that lots of people in Gilles Jaunet, they want the media to give them favorable attention. And so they say, no, we're nonviolent. Um, and I would say, just 
just wake up, open your eyes. It's not necessary. This has been going on, what, six months? And it's like in the popular imagination around the whole world, Gilles Jaunet is associated with riots. It's associated with fighting in the streets and people still support it. That's powerful. That shows that they've been able to break uh, the moralism that, that reflects the dominant values in society. They've been able to break with uh, negative coverage from the media and continue to do what they identify as necessary. So I think they've, they've gone past the need to identify with nonviolence, to pretend that, that they're a nice thing. And, and I think it's time to, to openly identify as anti-capitalist to make it very clear that, um, that people are sick of, of just so many years of, um, of all of these policies where the rich do one thing after another and the people on bottom, the poor people have to pay for it. So the rich people, they, they, with their um, investment policies, their banks collapse. And so then governments have to give hundreds of, of, have to give billions of dollars to save the banks. And that's money that they stole from us. Or uh, industrial capitalism is, is destroying the environment. It's already killing millions of people. It's driving um, most species to extinction. Uh, and then they, they expect you know, the, the poor people to pay for that while they, while they continue to make money off of it. So I think it's very powerful that, um, that people are fighting back against it. And I think they just need to realize that they don't have to use polite words anymore. They can, they can be direct. They've already created this power in the streets and they don't need to pretend anymore that they're, that they're friendly or they're civic. Uh, they, can, they can begin to openly talk about revolutionary goals. Um, and as for uh, responses to climate change, um, they're condemning us and they're condemning all future generations to misery. It's, uh, it's just insane that people are just sitting and waiting, saying, oh, maybe, maybe they'll pass the Paris Accords. Even if they do honor the Paris Accords, it's not enough. The, their climate scientists are very clear that the, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not enough. And there are very few governments that are even, that are even meeting that. So it, it's just very disturbing to see how many people are just sitting passively um, and, and waiting for those with power to solve the, the problem when it's clear that they won't. Given the fact that um, capitalism has created a problem that's threatening uh, everybody's life and that is already killing it's leading to hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of millions of more deaths every year because of flooding, because of disease, because of drought, because of food shortage. And it's, it's uh, causing the extinction of, of thousands and eventually millions of species. I think people really need to start speak, first speaking vocally and making it very clear that we would be justified doing almost anything to stop this. Um, uh, not... Uh, you know, obviously not something that would create a new authority that would be that would be able to to, to create a new problem like that. But uh, the banks, the politicians, uh, people in the oil industry should have zero legitimacy. They should be uh, acknowledged as mass murderers. And and I think any any attempt at, at dialogue with them or any um, attempt to extend them any human consideration, I think, is just uh, is just naive. They're they're making money off of killing everybody. And so to conclude, you say that we should act uh, without the consent of media or the consent of the majority of the population. We should act where it is uh, uh, relevant to act. Yeah, yeah. Um, the media belong to capitalist companies. It's nor they are capitalist companies themselves. They make their money from advertisers. It's absolutely normal that the perspectives that they project and broadcast are elite perspectives. Um, we need to develop our power to, to communicate directly all throughout society through counter-information projects, through, through decentralized and alternative media. Uh, if we're constantly worried about what the elite will think about us and what the media will say about us, uh, we'll never go anywhere. And many times when people fight with force, when people show that they're, that, that they're risking themselves for their convictions, that's what changes people's minds. So a peaceful protest almost never changes anybody's minds. But when people see that people that others are fighting and risking themselves for, for their own survival or for their ideas, then that 
forces them to, to take us seriously. So we do need to worry about um, relationships with the rest of society, about communicating with the rest of society, but we should not worry at all with, with elite opinions or, or with how we're presented in the media. If we're doing things right, the media will always present us uh, badly, but we need to create enough um, grassroots power to, to not rely on the media. So the, I think one of the most important things is, is solidarity and humility. There's no one revolutionary current that has all the answers. Uh, everybody makes mistakes. It's very important to be able to uh, receive criticism, uh, to be able to work with other people even though there are differences. For that solidarity to exist, it requires that no one tries to impose their ideas on the entire movement. So that means that if you try to impose nonviolence on an entire movement, then you are erasing all of these different experiences, all of these different needs. Or also if you have an, uh, an authoritarian framework of politics that you require everyone to, to work in one political party or everyone to follow one vanguard, then you're also destroying uh, the diversity which is the source of, I think, most of the collective intelligence in our movements. So for solidarity to work, we need to be able to accept criticism, we need to understand when we make mistakes, we need to learn how to work with other people, but also we need to avoid um, imposing one line uh, of struggle on a movement. Peter Galdalus, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Au travers de cette vidéo, on a voulu vous envoyer un message à vous les militantes et les militants euh, qui se revendiquent de la non-violence et surtout à ceux et à celles qui excluent les stratégies violentes. La violence que nous inflige tous les jours le système politico-économique actuel est sans précédent. Donc toutes les violences qui viseraient à détruire ce système doivent être encouragées et doivent être considérées comme légitimes. Nous nous épuisons à organiser des marches non violentes, des manifestations pacifiques, des actions symboliques pour réveiller nos dirigeants, etc. Mais ouvrons les yeux, ces stratégies ne suffisent pas. Nous n'avons plus 40 ans pour lutter. Toutes les actions qui visent à des changements à long terme nous mèneront très certainement à notre perte. Attention, je ne dis pas qu'il faut arrêter maintenant toutes les formes d'action non violentes. Il faut simplement arrêter de tout miser là-dessus. Et puis bien comprendre que si les médias mainstream félicitent nos actions, c'est pas un succès, c'est un échec. Ne cherchons plus à ce que nos actions soient populaires, mais à ce qu'elles soient efficaces. Frappons là où ça fait mal, passons à l'action directe plutôt qu'à l'action symbolique. Merci à tous d'avoir regardé cette vidéo jusqu'à la fin. Rendez-vous lundi pour une conférence en live de Peter Galderlos qui approfondira tout ce sujet. Merci aussi à tous ceux qui nous soutiennent financièrement sur Tipeee et sur Utip maintenant. Enfin, c'est très important, ça nous permet d'inviter des gens comme Peter et de les interviewer sur la chaîne. Donc merci pour tout et je vous dis à la semaine prochaine.